Hello, everybody. This is Joanne Factor with Strategic Living, Safety, and Self-Defense Training, coming to you again from the glorious Emerald City that is Seattle, Washington. And today is November 23rd, 2020. We are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe you're watching this video a few years in the future where COVID is just kind of like, you know, a memory um, and you're and well, but it's pretty real right now. And we're getting ready for Thanksgiving, which is going to be a little different. Usually we have family and friends over. Not so much this year. Okay. But today I'm going to be talking about getting support. Um, and support is really super important. Now, if you're watching this video, you undoubtedly know what I do. I'm a self-defense teacher. I've been teaching self-defense mostly to women and girls for over 25 years. And for most of those years, I've been teaching that self-care is an essential part of everyone's safety and self-defense planning. Now, self-care does cover a wide range of actions, um, like self-soothing behavior and like long-term self-care and even seeking professional help, like maybe exercise or meditation or listening to music or watching funny cat videos on YouTube, or a glass of wine, or seeking medical care, or, you know, just pick your top three ways to calm yourself when you're upset or anxious. Okay, now my personal favorite is playing music, maybe drumming along to some of my all-time favorite songs, or muddling through a guitar chord progression with lots of fuzz or overdrive and reverb. But if I had to pick just one self-care practice as the most critical, it has to be getting support from other people. We're humans. We are social creatures. Any assault or attempted assault, regardless of outcome, very often feels isolating to the person who was assaulted and like a loss of control over important aspects of life. Connecting with another human helps offset that, but only when that other human is supportive. We do live in a highly victim blaming culture and we have to recognize that not every one of our acquaintances or even family or closer friends will be open to supporting you. Now, over the years, I've heard from several students, well, more than several students, a lot of students, that when confiding in those who they assumed would be supportive, they were met with statements such as, well, what did you expect? Or, well, why, did you, why were you alone with them? Or, well, you sure won't make that mistake again. Or, I hope you learned something from that experience. Um... Or how could you let that happen to you? Now, some people are interested in hearing about others' misfortunes because they see they see it as like informing themselves as to what kind of mistakes you might have made so they won't make the same mistakes. And that's a kind of a human thing to do. As humans, we learn from other people's experience, and there's nothing wrong with that. You get into some problems um, when, especially when they you decide that they've made mistakes. We're going to talk about that a bit later, and it turns out it doesn't really work that way. Um, and it also when they decide to inform you of their conclusions, and they think that's helpful, and it's probably not. Now, it doesn't mean that it's a bad person, but it does mean they don't have or are not willing to make available emotional bandwidth for you. So now let's get back to getting support. How would we recognize that supportive human? Is there like a covert signal or maybe a secret handshake? No. It, you recognize them by what they do. Now, here's my thumbnail sketch of what a supportive human would do. They listen, they believe you, and they remind you it wasn't your fault. Three little things, that's it. Now I'm gonna go over each of these three little things. This video might be a little bit longer than many of my others, but oh well. 
Um, in this, and right now, I'm going to talk about the first one. They listen. Okay, now, first, I'm going to suggest that before you approach a person and assume they will listen to you, ask for consent. Okay, so consent is really important. Um, not just, you know, for having sex, but for a whole bunch of things, okay? Um, and give that other person a chance to assess their readiness to offer support or if necessary, to set their own boundaries. Um, say, hey, I'd like to share something with you. I need some support, and it, it can be really uncomfortable. This was a kind of scary thing that happened to me. And give that other person the chance to decide what their own boundaries are, because you know what? Even the most supportive people are not open and available 24-7, right? Self-care is important to everybody, including people who are good listeners. And an important part of support is that the support has to be voluntarily given. Now, the person listens. Let's talk about listening. Most of the time, experts say that a lot of times when we're listening, we're not really listening. We're kind of hearing enough to try to figure out what our snappy comeback is going to be. Now, somebody who is really listening is not trying to spend the time figuring out what pearls of wisdom they're going to toss in your direction. Listening is not letting you talk for 10, 20, or 60 seconds and then interrupting with, hey, did you try this? You could have done that. You should have done that. I would have done. Thank that person for their time and move on. They don't have the bandwidth for you. Rather, listening involves like taking in what the other person is offering. A really good listener will treat what you're saying as a gift because they trust you enough to confide in you. And um, if they have the emotional space, they will be paying attention to the event's impact on you. And you may hear something more like, that sounds horrible. I'm so sorry you had that experience. I am here for you. And now this is where listening gets super important. The listener should be assessing or even asking what you need. Do you need to just like talk? Sometimes people just need to get it off their chest and talk about it. And that's fine. Um, but it's always good to clarify what are the expectations. Now, maybe you're looking for advice. Okay, or maybe they have the next steps in mind and they want some help. And it is okay to ask clarification. Hey, um, I am here for you. Do you need me to listen? Are you looking for advice or are you looking for help for something you're already thinking of? Okay. And keep in mind that a really important part of the trauma of assault is the feeling that control over one's own life has been torn away and an important goal of the listener is to help empower those hurt by making sure that their choices are really theirs now we're going to move on to so we just talked about listen um now we're going to talk about they believe you super important but you know all of these are pretty important now for about 12 years, between 2003 and 2014, I worked through the VA Veterans Administration Medical Center in Seattle with Dr. Wendy David, Dr. Ann Cotton, and other VA staff on something called the Taking Charge Project. This was a 12-week self-defense program for women veterans who are suffering long-term chronic post-traumatic stress disorder as a result, mostly as a result of sexual assault while in military service. Um, now, if you're familiar with PTSD, you know it's not pretty. Now, in the, um, below this video in the comments, there's going to be a link to another short video for more on the psychology of post-traumatic stress disorder and it's on the effects and possible causes and it's, it's pretty it's a TED talk and it's pretty interesting now 
I'm not an expert on PTSD, and this video is not about PS PTSD. But it's important because there is a significant correlation between social supports and the likelihood of an assault survivor developing PTSD. And one commonality all the participants in the Taking Charge program had was a lack of support from those around them after their assaults. Now, I think I've mentioned this earlier, our culture does come with a large victim blaming component and sorting out those who are supportive from those who won't be supportive is critical to your long-term health and happiness. So they believe you. Most women are assaulted by somebody known to them, particularly in cases of sexual assault. They may be a friend, a co-worker, a classmate, a colleague, a family member, a family friend. Because of that, others you know will also likely know that assailant. When you confide in somebody in that same circle, it can kind of get complicated. The person who you're confiding in may themselves be struggling to wrap their brains around what you're telling them, which may be totally counter to their own experience with that assailant. Maybe they know the assailant as a nice person, you know, kind of fun to hang out with, um, but they hadn't had that assault experience with them. And they're trying to figure out how somebody they know as maybe kind and generous could have possibly done something so wrong. And we as humans do not do well with that sort of cognitive dissonance. And that can come out as questioning your account of what happened, which is does come across as non-supportive. It is non-supportive. Um, when somebody says, well, you know, there are two sides to everything, they're struggling also. But I mean, they might have their own struggles and that's fine. And what you're looking for is support. So find somebody else. One option is to confide in somebody from another social circle. Um, and another is to cultivate relationships of support, which I'm going to be talking about more towards the end of this particular video. Um, so somebody who is supportive is going to basically say, I believe you. Okay, maybe they won't say it explicitly, but you're, they're not going to say, are you sure? Um, maybe you misinterpreted what went on, what happened. Okay, now, finally, a person, a supportive person will remind you that the assault was not your fault, period, end of sentence. It is so common for the person assaulted or targeted to go, go over the details again and again and again in their heads, trying to figure out if what they could have done, should have done something different. Okay, now, maybe they could have done something different. Maybe it would have made a difference. Maybe it wouldn't have made a difference. But that whole search is overlooking a really basic fact that somebody else, namely the assailant, made that choice to harm somebody. Now, that's right. The assailant is not like it's a fast-moving river into which you just slipped and fell. Rivers don't make choices to injure or drown people. But people do. The assailant is the person who is responsible for their actions. If you are the listener, please make it a point to remind the person who's confiding in you of that. And... You know, in a nutshell, that's how you know somebody is supportive. They listen, they believe you, and they remind you it wasn't your fault. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this, and then we're going to move on to, well, do you really want to wait until you are in need of someone to talk to to find somebody to talk to? Mm. Show of hands? Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, so we're going to look at building supportive communities. Now we're going to go back a little bit to victim blaming because victim blaming is so pervasive. And even if we don't think we blame victims, just the environment and the words that come out might just be in that, like follow that kind of line of reasoning. Um, now, 
some words about those who habitually blame victims for their own assaults. This is chronic in domestic violence, for example, where the abuser is manipulating the target's perception, very often also manipulating the perception of people around, cutting off support. Um, and sometimes this is referred to as gaslighting. It's a long-term strategy to get the target to relinquish control and not trust their own ability to make their own decisions. Um, now, a major way of handling conflict or processing in our culture it's an advers is an adversarial approach. For example, our justice system and our political system are set up to pit two sides against each other. There are defined rules and referees, and they duke it out like a boxing match or a martial arts barring match, and a winner is picked. So it's not really a surprise to learn that some of us expand that view that life is just one big brutal competition. And this bleeds into other parts of our lives where maybe there are no such explicit rules, no referees, and it's not a good fit. And it's all about the power. Not that it works necessarily so great in our justice system and political system, but that, that's a different issue. Um, now, there does not need to be a long-term relationship for this blame shifting to occur. People who harm others will very likely try to shift attention away from themselves and their actions to what the victim did wrong. The stereotypical ones include what she was wearing, how much did she drink, and she was flirting. Now, others in our communities, like ourselves, we all want to stay safe. And part of the process, though, sometimes is to find out details about what happened to others. And as I said earlier, resolve not to make the same mistakes. And a big problem with this approach is the person who is targeted may or may not have been able to do something different, and maybe it could have made a difference, maybe not. And you know what? There are also people who do all the, quote, wrong stuff all the time. They smile at strangers. They drink a lot. Maybe sometimes pass out on a friend's couch and did not get assaulted. <gasps> How did that happen? Well, because there was no assailant present. The common element of all assault isn't your clothing choices, it's not your alcohol consumption, and it's not flirting. It is the presence of a person who made the bad choice to take what they wanted regardless of consent. Now, do you want to wait until after an assault to figure out who your supportive friends are? No. Rather, you can be cultivating those relationships now. My colleague Yehudi Zidikman of ESD Global um, has suggested in a recent blog post, and the link is below, that you practice talking about what-if scenarios with those important people in your life. One of the examples is if you're having a discussion with your mother. Mom, if something like this kind of assault ever happened to me, how would you react if I told you? Or maybe a conversation with a good friend, like, hey, I've never had this happen to me, but I'm wondering how you'd react if I came to you and told you. Add your story there. Now, maybe there was a recent assault in the news that you can use as an example. Okay, so I'm in Seattle. People jog around Green, Green Lake as a park. There's a very popular jogging trail. And maybe every once in a while, there is a story of some jogger who was assaulted at like 5 a.m. And you can say, hey, mom, this hasn't happened to me. But how would you react if I told you I was jogging around Green Lake at 5 a.m. and I was assaulted? Okay. Or you said that's your best friend. Or maybe there's a particular Me Too story that popped up in the news or you were talking about. Now, the response can give you some information about what they think of assault and blame. Now, temper this, because we all know there's often a gap between a, what a person says and what they will actually do. So take into account what you already know about them. 
But maybe more importantly, this will give them food for thought and it'll just open up that conversation because it's an uncomfortable conversation. We don't, you know, very often have these kind of conversations with people we know. Okay. And um, this does not have to be a one-off discussion. In fact, it should not be a one-off discussion. You're a transition, you transition that what if into a whole, like maybe theme of conversations on what it means to be supportive. What does it mean to be a friend? When do you want to be supportive? When do you feel it is important to be supportive? How to be supportive? What are your options? Okay, when these conversations happen with a few people in this part of your circle, that part of your circle, another part of your circle, maybe some of your family, some of your friends, some of your coworkers even, it becomes less awkward and you get a better sense of where people are at. And you find those who share your values and maybe you even move others to think about what the support really mean. Now, building these relationships takes a while and it is critical. And that's how communities begin. One relationship at a time. So why don't you begin with the very next conversation you have with someone close today? It's not too soon. Hey, this has been Joanne Factor with Strategic Living. Stay safe, live life.